Hostage, a Todd Mills mystery, book three in the series. Arthur R.D. Zimmerman, publisher, Scribble Pub. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 17. Shaken by the day's events, Todd sat in a near state of shock in the rear seat of the taxi. It was the first time all day he'd been both quiet and still, and he stared blankly out the left window as the cab whisked around the northern edge of Lake Calhoun. Given the gravity of the situation that had overtaken not only his life, but the entire nation, he hoped he'd done well in his coverage, conveying accurately what he had witnessed. He'd tried to be impartial, tried to be objective, but of course, that had been impossible. On the one hand, after speaking face to face with him, Todd thought worse of Clarendon than ever before. On the other hand, what had happened was horrific. Recalling it all with a shudder, Todd was only just now realizing how frightened he'd been. He closed his eyes, took a deep breath, just relax, you're okay, but he couldn't stop his mind from ricocheting from the abduction to national television. Surely many members of Congress and perhaps even the President himself had just seen him on TV, and then to matters more personal, specifically. What had happened to Rollins? He opened his eyes and stared at the large grayish plain of the still frozen lake, then pressed himself against the right window, saw his towering condominium building coming into sight. Lights dotted the structure here and there, and Todd quickly tried to find his apartment. Up there on the 15th floor, lights on at his place would mean Rollins was there and everything might be okay, right? Right? Starting from the ground, he tried counting floors, but then the car hit a pothole and Todd bounced in the back seat and lost focus. Arriving at his tall building on Dean Parkway, Todd tipped the taxi driver generously, grabbed his briefcase, and bounded out of the vehicle. He waved briefly at the security guard, an older man who buzzed him in and proceeded directly to the bank of mailboxes just off the main lobby. Hey! called the guard, hanging out the door of his small room. I just saw you on the evening news with that Dan Rather fellow. Todd struggled for a reply, finally saying with a shrug, Big afternoon. I'll say. Todd took out his keys, found the smallest one, and opened his mailbox. He pulled out a magazine and a handful of envelopes, then opened his briefcase and dropped in his mail. Glancing over to make sure the guard wasn't watching, Todd next pulled out the videotape of Clarendon's comments, and slipped it into his mailbox, which he locked tight. Crossing to the other side of the lobby, he hit a button and the elevator doors opened. Stepping in, he began to ascend. He hoped to some kind of truth. It flashed through his mind that something had happened and Rollins had never even left the apartment this morning. What if he'd slipped in the shower and knocked himself out? Or had a seizure of some sort? Perhaps, or Perhaps something else had come up and Rollins had simply left a note to that effect. Like, maybe his mother in rural Minnesota had had a heart attack and he'd been called out of town. Good grief. By the time Todd stopped, stepped into the 15th floor, he'd visited and weighed every possibility, still unable to settle on any kind of reasonable explanation for Rollins' absence and increasingly fearful of what it all meant. Hoping for some kind of immediate answer, he jabbed the key into the lock of his apartment, swung open the door. Crap. It was dark, not a light burning in the place. Todd stood in the doorway, wondering if he should just duck out and head straight over to Rollins' apartment. Wait, he reminded himself. Rollins could be lying unconscious in the bathroom. His head split open, or there could be a no, or... Why was it so cold in here? Peering into his darkened home, Todd didn't move. It wasn't simply that it felt unusually cool or chilly, but there was a distinct draft, a real gust of air blowing through the apartment, out the door and into the hall. Was one of the windows open? Without turning on a light, Todd took several steps, letting his front door swing shut behind him. He moved past the dark kitchen and right up to the edge of the living room. Todd froze. The sliding glass door to his balcony was pulled open, and Rollins stood on the balcony. Rather, Rollins had one foot on a chair, the other on the balcony railing. In one instant, Todd's heart jolted with anger at a barrage of testy questions. Where the hell have you been? 
Why haven't you called? What's the matter with you? The next moment, he understood something incomprehensible. Roland was about to jump. An adrenaline-fueled rush of panic surged through Todd, but he didn't budge. Oh, dear God. He cleared his throat, and his voice, weak and shaking, called, Rollins? When there was no reply, Todd took a couple of steps closer. The cool air gushed in, and from the street below, he could hear the stream of traffic, rubber tires humming against pavement, frustration turning to a mad honk, the screech of a quick break. Somewhere far off the safe sound of a siren. Safe because it was exactly that. So far, very far away. Rollins? Nothing. The solid figure, black against the dark blue hues of the early evening sky, didn't budge. Tied in still closer, wanting it once to dart forward, fearful at the same time what that might precipitate. Trembling, he realized that, of course, he was right. Of course, Rollins intended to jump. No fool would stand perched like that, poised as if to take a flying leaf off a diving board. Even one wrong flinch and he'd lose his balance and go tumbling over. I'm, I'm here. Rollins, it's me. Todd, I'm home. Began Todd, stuffing the panic, charging through him. Hey, buddy, I'm here. Let's, let's talk. It was as if he'd lost his hearing, as if he were deaf as a rock. Rollins just kept looking out, staring upward into the sky. As if, from this 15th floor balcony, he could leap right up there into the heavens without touching earthly reality and earthly pain ever again. God, no! Todd wanted to scream to go charging across the room, tackle Rollins, pin him down, hold him here, and not let him go, not ever. Instead, a kind of surreal common sense shackled him restraining him, holding him in control, and he crept across the soft carpet of his living room, one silent step at a time, more like an observer than a participant. He didn't take his eyes off the dark figure, afraid that if he even blinked, Rollins would be gone, vanished into the void, and thus he moved past the black leather couch, past the glass coffee table, past a side chair, the TV, the sliding glass door was pulled back, the screen door as well, only another ten feet, just past the table. Todd didn't make a noise, didn't say a word. No, obviously, nothing he could say would bring Rollins back, only force might. Finally, he reached the doorway to the balcony, and the cold night air blew over Todd, rippling his hair, chilling his bones. His eyes fixed laser-like on the back of Rollins, a shirt, no jacket, jeans, leather shoes, and Todd took a quick appraisal of just how it could be done. He stood as still if, as if he were about to slap a fly for one wrong move and things could tip the other way. Then he leaped into action. And Todd grabbed onto the door jam with his left hand and with his right lunged out and grabbed Rollins by the back of his jeans, plucked his lover from the edge. Todd heaved as hard as he could, eliciting an angry scream from Rollins. Todd tripped and fell inside, and Rollins came flying from his precipitous perch onto Todd, the two of them landing with an ugly crash on the carpet of the living room floor. In an instant, Todd's lunges exploded as the weight of Rollins crushed down on him, and as he lay wheezing on the floor, struggling for air, things truly blew up. "'You asshole!' screamed Rollins. "'You fucking asshole! What are you doing, goddammit-all?' For a brief instant, Todd feared that Rollins would do it. Just get right back up and dart onto the balcony, hurl himself over with a flying leap. Instead, he was all over Todd, fists swinging, feet kicking, unable to breathe, much less get up. Todd curled himself into a ball as Rollins' fury burst over him. You did this to me, didn't you? shrieked Rollins. What? what? gasped Todd. You fucker! A fist plunged into his side and Todd jerked back as the pain zipped through him. What the hell? He scrambled across the floor, scurrying on his hands and knees, trying to get away. Rollins took another swing. Todd ducked, gulping for air. Todd glanced over his shoulder and saw the rage, so absolute, so total, in Rollins' red, hysterical face. I'm gonna kill you, shouted Rollins. As Rollins lunged at him, Todd 
didn't doubt he meant it, and Todd crawled across the room, grabbing for a chair, a pillow, something, anything to shield the blows. Rollins came at him, shrieking, and Todd jabbed out a foot, catching Rollins by the ankle and tripping him. Rollins fell, crashing into the glass coffee table and smashing right through the top. The glass shattered beneath his weight, and then he lay there in the shards. His body heaved with side sobs. Todd, only just regaining his breath, half reached out. Rollins? Amid the glassy mess, the body moved, the head lifted. Todd begged. Huh, what, is, what is it, Rollins? What the hell are you? He pushed himself up, his face a tight, wrinkled, crying mass, and sobbed. I'm dead! What? I'm dead! Rollins, stop it! You're being... I have AIDS, he screamed. I'm going to die, just like John and Rick, just like Max, Al, David, Ed, Thomas, and Kurt. You hear me? I have AIDS, just like Kurt did. Everything exploded, and Todd couldn't move. No, no. Rollins sat back, staring at the palm of his left hand. There was a large chunk of glass sticking into him, and he looked at it, then pulled it free, as if he'd just uncorked a bottle. A deep rich flow of blood started pouring out of his hand, curling, dripping down his wrist, trailing down his arm. Oh, dear God, thought Todd. This couldn't be. Looking at Rollins' bloody hand, he didn't see the stuff of life dripping out of his lover. He saw poison gushing, oozing out. Their future flushed before him. His and Rollins' future. The doctors, the medications, the sores, the... No, he couldn't lose Rollins. And Todd grappled across the floor, his eyes welling with tears. He had to hold him, take him back, not let him go. Stop, shrieked Rollins, holding up his bloody hand as if Rollins had just pulled a gun on him. Todd jerked away, staring at the ribbon of blood as if it were some sort of hideous secret weapon. The plague to end all plagues. That's right, said Rollins in a deep, ugly voice as he pressed his hand closer to Todd. You don't want to ever come close to me again. No, no, but this was insane. This was impossible. Todd did indeed pull back, but then he scrambled to his feet and then he started running out of the lightless room, down the dark hall. The door to the linen closet was cracked wide and he threw it open. Plunging in his hands, he started groping for a towel. Suddenly, some unseen creature screeched and clawed him. Todd, in turn, screamed and jerked back at as Kurt's cat, girlfriend, who had been curled up on the towels, came shooting out like a missile, whizzing past Todd and disappearing into the bedroom. Todd caught his breath, reached a second time into the closet, grabbed a towel, thought better of it, took another. Rollins had AIDS. He started shaking, trembling. Let there be some kind of mistake. Don't let this be true. He heard an odd noise from the living room, and it flashed through his mind. Rollins did it. He jumped. Carrying the towels, he tore back down the hall into the living room, where he was greeted by the darkness and a cool gush of air. Rollins was no longer on the floor. The balcony door was open. The balcony itself as empty as if something had just flown away. Todd could move and his voice barely audible gasped. Rollins! In response came a frightened sob. Todd ran across the room, found him there curled in a ball and lying on his side behind a chair. He was sobbing. Todd stared down at this hysterical mass, saw Rollins lost in his fears. Homo, fag, queer. You fuck with another man and you're dead. Bad boy. You deserve it. You deserve to rot on this earth. Shame, shame, shame. Die, faggot. Did, did, did you do this? This to me? Begged Rollins, looking up through his tears. Perplexed, Todd stared at him. This strongest of men, who'd regressed to some kind of panicked child and said, What? Do you have it? Do you have it too? Todd suddenly understood. It made sense, of course, that that was why Rollins had attacked him with such fury. Oh shit. No, 
I'm okay, Rollins. You know I tested negative. Todd knelt down next to him. Give me your hand. But I'll be careful. Rollins gingerly held out his bleeding left hand and Todd wrapped a towel around it. First one, then the second for added protection. Todd tightened the towels and said, Tell me what happened. I... He began and then stopped. You went to the doctors? Rollins nodded. And what you got the results from some tests? Again, Rollins nodded, which meant, realized Todd, that of course Rollins had had blood drawn last week. Why the hell didn't you say anything before? Shit, never mind. That was a contra conversation for much later. Just stay focused. For now, just get all the facts. A hope flashed through Todd's mind and he asked, Are you HIV positive? Or is it, is it AIDS? The first meant there was more time. Time meant a greater chance. A chance for the new drugs to do their work. A chance for yet more drugs to be created. I'm probably just positive. Rollin shrugged, wiped his nose with the back of his right hand. But my doctor won't say for sure, not until he knows my T-cell count. Rollins, we'll get through this. We'll make it. They had to, thought Todd. They're doing all this great stuff now, all this wonderful stuff, you know, with the proteins inhibitors and all that. They're talking about AIDS becoming a manageable disease and... Fuck you, shouted Rollins, kicking at Todd and pushing him away. That's exactly what I used to say to Kurt. Oh, don't worry, you'll make it. There's AZT and they're doing all this great stuff now. And that's exactly what he used to say to his friends. There are all these great meds out there. Don't worry. The scientists are working around the clock. And did any of them make it? No. They're dead as dirt. Did they not suffer? You bet they did. Oh, Christ. Don't you remember the pain Kurt was in? And you know what? I'm spent. I've had so many friends die and I gave them all my courage. All my strength. Little good it did. But now, I don't have any energy left for myself. Todd was on his feet. He was at the balcony sliding shut the large door. And then he just stood there, staring out at the lake, at the distant plane circling the airport. Like blinking fireflies, he saw all that, just as clearly as he saw what lay ahead. All the tests, all the pills, all the stress and fear, all the desperate hope. Could he do it? Did he have the strength, the stamina, to be a martyr-like caregiver? He didn't know. Not really. Couldn't be sure. Michael, the first guy with whom Todd had had a serious relationship, had been murdered, and Todd didn't think he could go through it again, invest, and lose it all. Have someone else die, and right then, right at that same time, he realized that Michael's murder was somehow easier than this was going to be. Michael had been whole when he'd left this world. Michael was gone in a blink. Yes, he realized HIV and AIDS were some kind of horrible test. Just what of he had yet to learn? His eyes beating with tears, Todd knew only one truth, and he said, I don't want to lose you, Rollins. Guess again, you already have. But get real. Rollins clutched the towel around his hand, then pushed himself up. You know, I thought the same bust that hit Kurt missed me, but I was wrong. I just turned my back for an instant and didn't see it coming. And now it's got me under the wheels and it's about to. Stop it! Oh, Todd. Rollins took a deep sigh. You can't go back in the closet on this one. You can't hide in the dark. This is reality. This is here now and you know what? We're done. We're over. Todd turned around, stared at Rollins, who stood in the middle of the faintly lit room. What are you saying? I'm saying that I saw how freaked out you used to get when we went over to Kurt's. I saw how scared you were, how you shut down when you saw his emaciated body. Face it, man, you can't handle it. You can't. You're going to leave me, just like that shit left Kurt. Stop it. Trust me, AIDS is too fatty for you. What? You're telling me that I flunked some kind of test? Shouted Todd, wondering at the same time if he'd been that obvious. Well, fuck off. And if that's the way you feel, then get the fuck out of here. I don't need this. See, you've got your career, you don't need this, and you don't want it, said Rollins with a half smile and then turned and started for the door. Todd, horrified at what he just said and what was now happening, called, 
Wait! Forget it, Todd. We're over. We're done. You can barely take care of yourself, let alone someone with a terminal illness. Trust me, it's better this way. Better that we both face up to things and that the truth comes out now instead of... Instead of later. Oh, shit. This wasn't what he wanted. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. Starting after him, Todd shouted, Rollins, you can't go! You... As he headed for the door, Rollins stopped slowly, turned around. You know what I'd do if I were you. I'd get myself tested again, of course. You won't be absolutely sure for another six months or so. But I'd go right out tomorrow morning and take a test for the HIV virus. And while you're waiting to find out, you can curse me all you want. I'm sorry, Todd. I really am. I thought I was okay. As if he'd been slapped, Todd just stood there. Oh, God. He hadn't thought about that. Not really, and his mind whizzed through their history of sex, sorting who'd done what to whom. They'd been wise, they'd been smart, but they were talking about a virus, a little tiny microscopic thing that traveled in bits of bodily fluid. So what about the time they'd woken up at something like three in the morning, groping with lust? They'd had sex in some kind of blissfully dreamy fog, but what had they really done, and what about... Goodbye, Todd. He looked at Rollins, knew there was no stopping him, and realized that right then he wasn't so sure he wanted to anyway. Where are you going? asked Todd. To find the guy driving the bus. If it wasn't you who hit me, I have a good idea who did. Rollins shrugged. I don't know why it's so important for me to put all the pieces together, but it is. I suppose if I can't understand life, then the least I want to understand is my own death. Todd said, nothing, just stood there in some kind of shock as he let the person he loved most in the world walk through his door and out of his life. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.